The realization hit after I'd spent decades parroting the only story I knew. When understanding finally dawned, I lurched on the heated table violently. Jackie, the lash extension lady hovering six inches above my upside-down face, could have dropped her pointy tweezers in my eye. I'd been describing the first photograph of me in my childhood photo album. I wore a stiffly starched dress, ruffled anklets, and tiny orthopedic shoes. Our collie mix, Joe, rested at my feet at the base of the towering maple tree in front of our old farmhouse. It was 1961, so the photo was black and white. I knew, because my mother later told me, my tightly curled halo of hair was tinted red, the result of a tonette perm and a henna rinse. I was only twenty months old, but Mom— A beautician with a head full of bottle-blonde cotton candy curls said the ministrations were necessary. She said I'd been maltreated in the foster home where I first lived after I'd been given up for adoption. Your hair was so fine and lifeless, I decided to cut it all off and give you some color and body, she said. It made sense. After many years of foster kids— and a previously failed adoption attempt, Mom was hopeful she might soon have her own little forever kid, and she'd want me to be as fashionable as she was. That story was normally part of my repertoire when describing my stubborn, eccentric, overprotective mother. Sometimes I switched it out with the tale of the time she gave ten-year-old me a sex ed talk while driving to church or the incident when she grabbed one of her misbehaving chickens around the neck and tossed it in the outhouse to give it time to settle down. My stories about Millie were always sweetly received, which is exactly what I wanted. As much as I loved her, I knew she often needed some good PR. It was easier telling stories about my dad, who was bald, handsome, sweet-natured, generous, and funny. He was always plowing the driveways of the widows on our road, or scooping up coleslaw for the Friday Night Lions Club fish fry, or transporting human eyes in a cooler from the big hospital in Lansing to the eye bank in Ann Arbor. I know the last sounds odd, but in the 1970s, it was allowed. Dad would go to a hospital in Lansing or Flint, pick up a carefully wrapped, shoebox-sized parcel packed into a cooler with ice bags, and drive it an hour and a half to the destination. He did this after a 5 a.m. wake-up call and eight-hour workday, getting home at 8 to 9 p.m., going to bed, and starting all over again. Mom was a harder sell.